a level? Oh, sure. Mic one, test test. That's good. Mic two, test test. Don, heck, rat, shoot! Oh, sorry for my language. Could you please try again? Test test. You okay? You seem a little keyed up. I heard old leather lips is on the warpath. Want to try three? Test test. What's wrong with the producer? Miss Nettle, something crawl out of her cream of wheat? What started her up? Actually, she's a self-starter. Apparently, listenership is down. She's blaming everyone but herself. When she inherited the station from her dearly departed husband, everybody thought she would just sell it. I think her trying to run it is a big mistake. Try the police up, would you? Test, test. Well, there's not much I can do about Miss Nettle. Um, I just come in and do my job. Yeah, me too. But she shuts us down for that singing sister act she keeps threatening us with. There's no guarantee we'll keep me on. I can imagine. It's pretty certain they won't keep any of the actors either. Of course, not for a variety show. Oh, hi, Freddy. I was uh, hoping you'd catch me alone. I mean, I'll see you before the show. Not like alone necessarily, of course. That would just be silly. <laughs> I, uh. Oh dear, I'm just embarrassing myself now. I'm going to try this again. <laughs> what was that all about? Are you pulling my leg? Betty's crazy for you. She'll tell me you've never noticed. You have to be blind count. Uh, well, Betty is swell, there's no doubt about that. But I think she has the hots for Lance. Why would a gal like that be interested in me anyways? Lance is the big star. Yeah, with an ego to match. It's a wonder he gets head through the door of the studio. I wonder how many pounds of air pressure it takes to keep it that size. <laughs> Lance is a bit of a prick, but not a bad guy if you ignore the fact that he's a bit insensitive and self-absorbed. That's like saying he's a sterling individual except for the murderous streak. <laughs> see each other ever again. And a Merry Christmas to you too. Jeepers, buddy, you worry too much. The show will be a hit, the network will pick us up for another season, and we'll create worry lines for nothing. That's okay. Handle wrinkles. Even my mom says I have the face for radio. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Hi, Leslie. I was just wondering if you guys saw that crazy twin coming through earlier. <laughs> <laughs> you have a twin? That's news. What's her, wait. You have a twin? Oh, yes. Uh, she looks just like me and sounds exactly like me, but she's always doing the stupidest things. I'm forever getting in trouble because of her. You have a twin, huh? That's news. What's her name? Her name is, uh, Betty, too. Um, except I was born Elizabeth while she was born, uh, Bethany. When your folks would call your name, how could you tell which one they meant? Well, I'm so much taller. Yes, Anne. <laughs> And I think you're the bee's knees, buddy. I, I mean, oh, look at the time. I have to be over there somewhere. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh -huh. oh, oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Boyle. How clumsy of me. Yes, it was. I will overlook it this time because of the high quality person I am. Oh, my God. Now, get out of my way. Poor thing is head over heels in love with me. Foolish woman. Ah, uh, well, who can blame her? I am after one, uh, after all, one of the best voice actors in the industry. One of the humblest, too. Yes, good of you to notice, Bradley. <laughs> it's funny. Yes, so you claim. 
Anyway, have you finished with the technical tomfoolery yet? I need to begin my vocal exercises. Mike, I'll check out okay. Go ahead with your pre-game warm up. Do you people mind? My brilliance depends on careful preparation. <laughs> Good script probably helps. The script is irrelevant. With this voice, I could read the telephone book and make people weep. Sound of your voice. <laughs> Sorry, me. <coughs> it's, it's dusty in here. You people are insufferable. Call me five minutes before showtime. I will be in my dressing room. Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> Clara, what is up? Hi. You're not even supposed to be on the sound stage. What kind of sister even are you? Sorry, buddy, but I wanted to warn you. Miss Nettle is mad as a wet hen. She's about to smarge a wet hen. Quite, Leslie, you're not helping. <laughs> but, Clara, what was Miss Nettle so angry about? She just got the listenership results for the station and said the numbers are dropping like the pants in a boat below comment. She thinks this new Tangle TV thing's gonna kill radio. She doesn't think radio stations will be around in the next ten years. TV, huh? That's what's getting all the things in the papers anymore. That's for sure. Maybe we should start trying to get TV jobs. No way. Her television will make you go blind if you watch it for too long. Especially if you watch it in the dark. Radio is much safer. I think all this TV stuff will just be a flashing thing. That's true. Who's going to stare at a tiny screen for hours on end? <laughs> well, with a face like yours, you better hope TV doesn't become popular. Because when it comes to your voice, it's the most attractive thing on you. Wow. Thanks a lot, killer. With a sister like you, who needs enemies? Oh, don't be like that, buddy. You know, I'm just joshing you. Anyway, I bring it back to the office before old man gets a me. <laughs> I wonder why she's so funny about the actors mixing with the office staff. She thinks your weirdness might rub off, I guess. Good heavens, young lady. What are you doing in here? I was given to understand that office minions weren't allowed in the studio. Well, I was just bringing Mr. Brown his fan mail. And I was just leaving. Fuck, he gets fan mail? It's funny. I got the odd piece here and there. I can imagine they must be odd. I have my fan mail directed to my secretary for processing. Who can be bothered with such a piffle? Next time, there you are. What are you doing with the riffraff? Ah, oh, Miss Taylor, so good to see you once more. I've been looking all over for you. What are you, um, you're looking as lovely as always. Not necessarily a compliment. But... <laughs> <laughs> I better leave before <laughs> <laughs> You really must not allow that woman into the studio. She is a secretary, for heaven's sake. A secretary. Yeah, next thing you'll know, they'll let the janitors in here. <laughs> they do let janitors in here. Who do you think cleans up after us? You can <laughs> touch things you touch later. <laughs> That's disgusting. Why would you say such things? Have you no coof? Sorry, I, I thought you knew. Anyway, where are Ronald Darren Frank and Doris? You haven't seen any of them, have you? Who? You know, the other people in your past. I've talked to Betty already, so I know she's in the building. Oh, yes, them. How should I know? I am not interested in keeping tabs on them. I can assure you. Why would I care to monitor my inferiors? I am the Foley artist, after all. My sound effects are the perfect counterpart to Lassie's spectacular voice. Do not call me Lancy ever again. My apologies, darling. Hello, everyone. Are we ready for a great show? Oh, uh, hello, Mrs. Knight. So glad to see you. Oh, buddy, you're always so formal. I insist you call me Doris. <laughs> hello, Doris. Nice to see you again. From you, Mr. Boyle, I, can, I would insist you call me Miss Knight. <laughs> oh, why I never. Don't listen to her, Lancy. You know how uppity those big stars can get. Do not call me Lancy. And I am the big star around here. Yes, we all know you're a legend in your own dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> Can we try and get along? 
we're done with rehearsals and just have to get through the live show, and then we'll be able to take a break. Okay? It's time at the show a great one to prove that radio is still king. Come on. Seen Ronald? He hasn't shown up. He's half the voices for crying out loud. He has to be here. Oh, do not look at me. I could do every voice if I had the mind to, but I'm the voices by my contract, and that is all I shall do. You're such a teen fella. You make me quiver with inspiration. And here I thought the quivering was a type of palsy caused by the aging process. <laughs> Let's try and have nice from Miss Nettle when she comes in. She's as angry as Betty says. Yeah, even angrier, I think. I have yet to see her think. Here, I have a sound effect for you. Mm. Oh, oh, dear. Miss Knight. Oh, uh, gosh, Miss Knight. I, I, Doris, I feel like there's more constructive ways to deal with that. Uh, I can fight my own battles. You see, Doris here has shown her the lack of class she has to work with. Such an, um, Disadvantage at her advanced age, too. Is it hard to put yourself forward as some kind of model class when you're just an ugly sow? That's one grunt for yes and two for no. <laughs> <laughs> I see my initial impression of you has been borne out. You, madame, are insufferable. You are an insufferable bore. <laughs> I would not waste a rotten tomato on one of your performances. Why, you pompous crazy! <laughs> And will you people please stop calling me Lancy? Enough! Mr. Boyle, if your next words are not complimentary or an admission that you're a pompous adult, I will see to it that your severance check gets lost in the mail. Did I mention how lovely you look today? May I save Lancy? Where are the rest of the cast? We're missing three people. Uh, they aren't here yet, but I'm certain they'll show up any second. What do you mean they're not here yet? Uh, I really can't say where they are, ma'am. <coughs> they're probably at a bar somewhere. I'm sure I saw liquor on them the other day at rehearsal. I'm, I'm not sure to ma be making those sort of assumptions about uh, the people we work with. There can be a lot of innocent reasons for not showing up to work, right? Yeah, like being in the drunk tank downtown, or drinking and driving and crashing the vehicle. Really? Because I heard that they were volunteering with some orphans and then dropping some food off at the homeless shelter before coming here. Enough! I don't care what your difficulties may be. We go live in ten minutes, and if we do not have a show, I will see to it that none of you work in radio again. Boyle, you will take over for the rest of the cast, and you will voice the rest of the characters if they choose to show up. I have a contract. I don't give a fig if you have a lawyer stored away in your trench coat. I thought it was you actors who go by the chrono. The show must go on! Here's my credo, Miss Knight. Um, as your inferiors call you, my credo is to leave, is to leave a sinking ship when I see one. I hereby resign. Fine. Get lost with your girlfriend too, Lancy. She only provided the sound effects. She didn't even provide any voices. Anyone can make sound. <laughs> Look here, you dried up old magpie. Without me, you have no show. I was thinking of staying, but 
I wouldn't work for a two-bit broom rider like you if it was the last job in the state. <laughs> I will see to it, that is. Goodbye, then, one of one and all. Good luck doing the show without the star. Any male voice voices, but Bradley and no sound effects. People will be switching to listen to paint dry. <laughs> We go live in 10 minutes, and when the on-air sign lights up, I will be in my office, and you better have a show, or else. Oh, man, we're in for it now. I can't do all the male voices. I'm only supposed to be Bob Cratchit and a merchant. What am I going to do? Maybe if we... Yeah, maybe if we... If only we had Clara here, and maybe Ronald. Maybe Clara could help? I don't know. Here, wait. I'll go and look for them. Okay, yeah. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon the exchange 
for anything, he chose to put his hand to. Scrooge and Marley were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, sole administrator, sole friend, and his sole mourner. There was no doubt about that Marley was dead. However, this must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come from this story. I'm going to relate. Oh, but Scrooge was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone. Covetous old sinner. Nobody ever stopped him in the street. No beggars implored him to a stout trifle. No children asked him for the time. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. Once upon a time of the good old days in the year on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. 48, 49, 50, 51. It was a cold, bleak winter. Weather, the door of Scrooge, the door of Scrooge's counting house was open so that he might keep his eye upon the clerk, who in dismal little cell beyond was copying letters. Merry Christmas. Oh, God save you. It was Scrooge's nephew, Fred, who came upon him. Bah, humbug. Christmas of humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas? What right have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come on, then. What right have you to be this missile? You're rich enough. Don't cross, Uncle. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas? What's Christmas time to you but paying bills without money? Finding, time, finding yourself a year older but not an hour richer. Uncle. Nephew, keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mind. Keep it, but you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone then. Much good may it do you. Much good has it ever done you. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come on, dine with us tomorrow. I have no interest in your fooly merriment. Merriment. But why? Why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love? Good afternoon. <laughs> Nay, Uncle. But you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon. I'm sorry, all my heart, to find you so resolute. We have never had a quarrel to which I have been a party. But I have made the trial of how much to Christmas, and I will keep my Christmas humor to the last. So Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. Gentlemen, see you, sir. Scrooge and Marley, I believe I have the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley. Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. At this festive season of year, Mr. Scrooge is more than usual, usual desire that we should make some time, some slight provision for the poor and the people who suffer. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons, I'm afraid. And union workhouses, they're still in operation? They are still. I wish I could say they're not. The treadmill of the poor and law are in full vigor then. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you said at first that something had uh, occurred to stop them in their useful course. I'm very glad to hear it. A few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of war. We choose this time because it is the time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. I don't make my marry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people marry. I help us to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, they better do it and decrease the surplus population. But, sir. It's not my business. It's not for a man. It's enough for a man to understand his own business. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon. And you, Cratchit, you'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose? It's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. It's only once a year, sir. It means so much to the children. Poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December but I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here earlier the next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out to growl. <sighs> You're listening to Man Hat Radio Theater Plays performance of A Christmas Carol, based on Charles Dickens' classic novel. Please stay tuned for station identification and a word from our sponsors. This is the long break really due to a short newscast, isn't it? 
I think so. Uh, I think you and I are wrong, though. I think I'm the wonder off. The show is going tremendously, isn't it? It is, Ronald, but you can't have any more to drink or get lit up like an evening in Paris. Yes, but the last thing you need is another drink. Don't be silly. I am as jober as such. I am not giving it up if that's the last thing I do. I refuse to go on stage alone. Come on, Ronald, our career may depend on it. Something else, come on. Ronald, how about we all go for drinks after the show? What do you say? No, 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 no. I just makes you guys deal. I will drink it if you guys don't. But if you don't, I will drink it all for sure. Oh dear, I don't know. I really like alcohol. I'm gonna all dizzy and giggly. <laughs> Well, I don't really know what else we can do. I've been going towards smoking the nurse, nurse could sure use it. If everybody else is having something on that as well. <laughs> if this is what it takes, this is what it takes. Pass the bottle. <laughs> Alright. Oh, oh, it's safe. So me, so. son. Yeah. Alright, alright. Oh. 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 Tights and boots. 
The chain he drew was long and wound about him like a tail. It was made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, and legends wrought in steel. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? You're particular for a shade. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down? I can. Do it then. <laughs> Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so um, a ghost might find himself in a condition to take a chair and felt that in the evening of it being impossible, it might involve an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace as if it were quite used to it. You don't believe in me. I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight stomach disorder might make them cheat. Uh, you, you may be a bit of undigested beef, a blot of mess mustard, a crumb of tr trees, a fragment of underdone potato. There's more of gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel, in his heart, by any means wagon. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his terror. <laughs> Mercy, dreadful aberration, why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do, I do, I do, I must. But why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? If a spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe! <laughs> Why do you come to me now? Hear me! My time is nearly gone. I will, but don't be hard upon me, Jacob, I pray thee. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance of hope of my procuring, Ebenezer, due to my efforts. You were always a good friend, Jacob. You will be haunted by three spirits. I... I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to avoid the path that I tread. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell rings one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over with? Expect the second on the night, next night at the same hour, the third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and for your own sake, remember what has passed between us. When it had said these words, the apparition walked backwards from him. And at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the specter reached it, it was wide open. Scrooge closed the window and went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep upon the We will now pause for station identification. This is W. Joy in New York. Why have one when you can have three? Carterments! Fun for the whole office! <laughs> Please stay tuned for a Christmas carol. Dickens' famous classic, brought to you by the Manhattan Radio Theater Players. Scrooge awoke at the sound of the trolling of one. Light flashed up from the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were suddenly drawn aside by a hand. Scrooge, straightened up, found himself face to face with an unearthly visitor who drew them. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not like a child, like an old man. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. What business do you have with me? Your welfare. Should, would not my welfare be better served by a night of unbroken rest? Your reclamation, then. Thank you. I am more walk with me. I am mortal and liable to fall. A uh, bear but the touch of my hand, and you shall be upheld in more than this. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall, and stood upon an open country road with fields on either hand. The city had an entire vanished. Was clear cold winter day with snow upon the ground. Good heavens, I was a boy here. You recollect the way? Remember it, I could walk it blindfold. Walk along the road. Scrooge 
recognize that every gate, post, and tree, until the little market town appeared in the distance. These are like shadows and things that have been. They have no consciousness of that. The travelers came on as they came. Um, Scrooge knew, um, knew and named one of, uh, named everyone. Bless my soul, there's Robbie Pitt. Why, why was he filled with gladness when, when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas? They, as they parted at crossroads and byways, what was Merry Christmas until to Scrooge? What had it? What good had it ever done to him? Yonder school is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. I know it. They went. The ghost and Scrooge. Um, they went. The ghost and Scrooge across the hall to a door in the back. It opened before them, and um, disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room made. Farther still, by lines of plain desks, at one of these well, well, at one of these, a lonely boy was reading at a feeble fire, and Scrooge sat down and wept, and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he used to. Be. I wish, but it's too late now. What is the matter? Nothing, nothing. There, there was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should have given him something. That's all. A good sign. Let us see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at these words. At the same room, become a little darker and more dirty. He was not reading now, but walking up and down desperately. Scrooge glanced anxiously towards the door. It opened, and a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in and putting her arms about his neck and kissing him all over. Dear, dear brother, Dan, I have come to bring you home, 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 dear brother, to bring you home, home, home. Home, little fam? Yes, home for good and all, home forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be, that home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed, and I was not afraid to ask him once more if he might come home. And he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you, and and are never to come back here, but first, we're to be kept together all Christmas long and have the merriest time in the world. You're quite a woman, fam. Oh, there comes the headmistress. Bring down Master Scrooge's box. There! Always a delicate creature, who a breath might have withered, but she had a large heart. So she had. She died a woman and had, as I think, children. One child. Fruit, your nephew, Fred. God help me. Yes. Although they had but a moment left, the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of the city, where shadowy passages passed and repassed. It was made quite plain enough by dressing of the shop that here to Christmas time, but was but was evening, and streets were lit up. The ghost stuck at a certain warehouse door. Do you know this place? You know it. I was apprenticed here. They went in at the sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk that if he had been two inches taller, he might have knocked his head again. <coughs> Why is old Fezziwig? Bless his heart! Fezziwig alive again! You hold there, Ebenezer. There he is. He was very much attached to me. Dear, dear. You hold, my boys. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Christmas Ebenezer. Let's clear away, my lads, before a man can jade, say Jack Robinson. When the clock struck eleven, Mr. and Miss Fezziwig took their station on one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as they went out, wish them a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> This jester was a small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small? Is it not? He has spent a few pounds of your mortal money. Three or four pounds. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that, Spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. 
say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. Oh, no, something I think. I would just like to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. My time goes short, quick. These words produced an immediate effect. Again, Scrooge saw him. He was a man in the prime of his life. His face had not the harsh and gritty lines of later years, but it had begun to wear signs of age. He was not alone, but sat aside a fair young girl in a morning dress, in whose eyes there were tears. What of these tears? It matters to you very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in the time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of a sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion, gay, engrossed you, have I not? What then, even if I have grown so much wiser, I have not changed towards you? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until in good seasons we could improve our worldly fortunes by our patient industry. I was a boy. Your own feelings tell you that you are not what you are. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought about this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it, and I can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words? No. Never. What, then? In a changed nature, if there has, has never been between us, Tell me, would you, would you seek me out and try to win me now? I, I, it matters not. I would gladly think otherwise if I could. Heavens knows, but if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can I even believe that you would choose me? I release you with full heart and for the love of him you once were. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? I told you, these were shadows of the things that have been. But they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove it. I cannot bear it. He turned upon the ghost, and seeing that it locked up about him with a face in which some strange way there were fragments of all the faces it had shown, Scrooge began to wrestle with it. Leave me, take it back, I cannot, I haunt me no longer. The struggle of Scrooge was over, overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, but, and then, of being stuck in his own bed, he sank into a heavy sleep and awoke once more when the bell struck one. He grimly got up and shuffled to the door, then opened it. Ooh. It was his own room, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were hung with living green, crisp leaves of Hollywood poly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back with the light as a mist as a, as a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney. In easy state upon the um, upon the couch, there sat a jolly giant who bore a brow glowing touch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn. Come in, come in and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. Have you not seen the likes of me before? Never. Have you ever walked forth with the younger members of my family, my elder brothers born in these later years? I don't think I have. I am afraid I have not. How many brothers, Spirit? More than 1,800. A tremendous family to provide for. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have anything to teach me, let me profit from it. Touch my robe. Scrooge held it fast. The lush greenery and bounty all vanished instantly. In less than a minute, they stood in the, the city street on Christmas morning, outside of Bob Cratchit's house. She laid a tablecloth beside, about by Belinda Cratchit second of a daughter, 
also braided in ribbons, while Master Peter Crutchet worked at the saucepan of potatoes, and now two small crutches, boy and girl, can tear in it. Basket of luxurious, of luxurious thoughts of sage and onion. These young crutches danced about the table. Hurrah! That's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart, alive, my dear. How late are you? Come give us a kiss, my dear. Now I can put away your worries. We had a lot of work to finish up last night and I had to clear away this morning, Mother. It was a dreadful bore. Well, never mind, so long as you come. See you down by the fire, my dear, and have a nice, warm, bl Lord bless you. Oh, my dear. Not here now, Tim. Go with the other little ones and get cleaned up for supper. How did little Tim behave in church? As good as the gold and better. And a Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless, God bless us. us. God bless us, everyone. Spirit, tell me if tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without, a court, without an owner. Carefully preserved, if these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, oh no, kind spirit. Say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by a future, none of my, of my race will find him here. What then? If she, he would like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Spirit, I cannot bear to hear those words I spoke. I am overcome with penance and grief. Let's listen longer to this happy family. See the joy in their faces. And now let's all raise a glass of Christmas cheer. I'll give you, Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. I'll drink to Mr. Scrooge. Stop, My heart is broken. I can't carry on. I quit. Oh, come on. You quit. What you need to do? Not only do we need her, we need her about three minutes. You know what, honey? You don't need me. You know nothing about me. I, however, feel me deeply, but you deeply. Right here in my heart. It's right here. Do you know what I'm saying? This is funny. Remember more over here. Uh, gosh, Betty, I don't know what to say. How about we finish the show and then we can talk about your needs and uh, feelings and stuff like that or whatever. What about my needs? No one cares about my needs. Nope. Of course we care about your needs, Ronald. In fact, we care so highly about your biggest need that we're helping you drink it. I have needs too, but Betty, I would never let my infatuation with a man get in the way of a great performance. No man is worth that. You're right, Doris. a girl. Career is more important than men. Her time is doesn't. You tell him, Betty. Uh. Smiling by his side and looking at 
the same that he was approving of Dr. Bird. <laughs> and he said, but Christmas was a humbug. As I lived, he believed it too. More shame for him, Fred. He's a comical old fellow, that's the truth. Not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I am sure he is very rich, Fred. At least Rose told me so. Uh, <laughs> oh, what a friend, my dear. His wealth is of no use to him. He doesn't even make himself comfortable with it. No patience with him. Uh, oh, I have. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill wounds? Himself, always. The consequence of his taking a disliking to us has, and not only making merry with us, as I think that he loses some pleasant moments, which could do him no harm, I mean, to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not. For I pity him. If you only, uh, if it only puts, puts him to give the same chance. If it only puts him in vain of leaving his poor clerk 50 pounds, that's something. And I think I shook him yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at the notion of sh sh shaking Shaggy. He encouraged them in their measurement and had passed the ball joyously. Uh, and he's given us plenty of merriment. I'm sure he would find it ungrate wouldn't be ungrateful not to drink to his health. Here is a glass of mulled wine ready to hand at the moment. And I say, Uncle Scrooge. You ready? Very well, Uncle Scrooge. Scrooge had become so light of heart um, that he would have pledged the, the unconscious company in return and thanked them in an inaudible speech. The ghost had given him time, but the whole scene passed off the breath of the last spoke word spoken by his nephew. And he had the spirit were, were again upon their travels. Scrooge noticed while he remained unaltered by it, his outward form. The ghost grew clearer, older, looking at the spirit as they stood um, in an open plain place. You saw that his hair was gray. Our spirits lie so short. My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. Forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask, but I see something strange, none not belonging to yourself, protruding from your skirt. Is it a foot or a claw? Look here. From the foldings of its robe, it brought forth two children, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of its garment. They were a boy and a girl, ragged scoundrels, the two in their humanity. Scrooge started back, applauded. So, spirit, are they yours? They are mad, and they cling to me for protection. This boy is ignorance, this girl is want. Beware of them both, but most beware of this boy. Have they no refuge or resource? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Scrooge looked the pelican for the ghost and saw it not. At the last word of twelve ceased to vibrate, he remembered this prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, he held a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like the mist along the ground towards Merciful heaven! The phantom slowly approached it when it came near. Scrooge bent down upon his knee and was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it with me, save one outstretched hand. Am I in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come? The spirit answered not, but pointed downward with its hand. You are about to show me shadows of things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is that so, spirit? Spirit inclined its head. That's the only answer you received. The ghost of the future, I fear you more than any other specter I have seen. But, as I know, your promise is to do me good, and I hope to live to be another man from what I was. I am prepared to bear your company, and I do, and I do it with a thankful heart. Lead on. The night is waning fast, and this is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. 
The phantom moved away, and it had come towards him. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress. The city seemed to spring up about them and encompass them of its own act. But there were in that heart amongst the merchants at the exchange. The spirit stopped beside them. One little knot of businessmen observing at the hand was pointing to them. Scrooge advanced to listen. No, I don't want to know much about it either way. I am one of his own. Well, when did he die? Last night, I believe. Why? What was the matter with him? Thought he'd never die. So did he, I'm sure. I find it all rather boring. What has he done with the money? I haven't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps? He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. <laughs> it's likely to be a very cheap funeral. For in my life, I don't know if anybody will go to it. I don't mind how his lunch is provided. <laughs> Scrooge recognized the merchants and looked towards the spirit for an explanation. Spirit! I see, I see. The case of an unpopular man might be my own. My life tends to be that way now. If, if there is a person in town who feels emotion caused by this man's death, show that person to me, spirit, I beseech you. Mrs. Branton, the phantom spread its dark world before him for a moment, realizing a room where a mother and her children were. A long expected knock was heard upon the door. She hurried to meet her husband, a man whose face was terrible, um, who he was young. There, there was a remarkable expression on it now, and kind of serious delight of which he felt ashamed, and which he struggled to repress. The news, is it good or bad? Bad. We are quite ruined. No, there is hope yet, Caroline. If he relents upon our loan for just a week, there is. Nothing is past hope if such a miracle has happened. It, he is past relenting. He is dead. That, what that half-drunken woman whom I told you of last night said to me when I tried to see him and obtain last week's delay, and what I thought was a mere excuse to avoid me, turns out to have been quite true. He was not only then very ill, but dying. To whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know. But before that time, we shall be ready with the money. And even though we were not, it would be a bad fortune indeed to find so merciless a creditor to his successor. We shall sleep tonight with light hearts, Caroline. Let me see some tenderness connected with the debt. The ghost conducted him through several streets until they entered old Bob Crescent House and found Mother and children seated round the fire, quite, very quiet. The little noisy cratchits were as still as statues in one corner. Oh, my soul, not Tiny Tim. He must be near his time. Past it, Ralpho. Well, I think he walks a little slower than he used to these last few evenings, Mother. And there's your father at the door. My dear, I wish you could have gone. It would have done you so good to see how great a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised I would walk by there on a Sunday. My little child, my little child, my little tiny Tim. Not the boy, oh Spectre. Something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. Before we leave this place, tell me what the man that was. As if in answer, a churchyard appeared. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Scrooge advanced it trembling. Before I draw nearer to the stone at which you point, answer me one question. Are these shadows of things that will be, or are they shadows of things that only may be? Still, the ghost pointed down this to the grave, by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, to which, if preserved it, they must lead. But if courses are deport, departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was in, immovable as ever. Scrooge crept away to grave trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of an expected of the neglected grave of the bone. No, spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. Why show me this if I am past all hope? For the first time, the hand of, appeared to shake. Good spirit, assure me that I yet may change these shadows who have shown me. By an altered light, 
I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all year. I will live it in the past, the present, and the future. Tell all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. In his agony, he caught this, he caught this spectral hand. It thought to free itself, but it, he was strong, and it shrunk, collapsed, and he went down into a bed. My bed Yes, my bed, my room, it's time to make an advance. He was so flooded and throwing with good intentions. His broken voice would scarcely answer his call. He had been sobbing in his conflict with his spirit, and his face was wet with tears. I am here. The shadows of things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be. No, they will. He arrived into his sitting room and was now standing there, perfectly winded. There is the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered. There is the corner where the ghost of Christmas present sat. There is the window where I was wandering in the spirit. I, it's all right. It's all true. It all happened. I don't know what day of the month it is. I don't care how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. Never mind. I don't care. Woohoo! He was checked into the chapel by the churches ringing out the lustiest pill he had ever heard. Oh, glorious, glorious! Running to the window, he opened it, to his head. No fog, no mist, only clear, bright, jovial, steering and cold, merry bellies, scrooged by an urchin in the street. You, you boy, what's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why Christmas Day? It's Christmas Day, I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do anything they like, of course they can. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Do you know the Polters? The street next to, next but that one, the corner? Oh, I should hope I did. A uh, remarkable boy. Do you know whether they sold the prized turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prized turkey, the big one. It's hanging in the mouth. Is it? Go and buy it. What? No, no, I am in earnest. Come back with the man in less than five minutes and I'll give you a half a crown. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. He shan't know who sent it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. He dressed himself all in the bed, and at last got into the street, walking with his, with his hand behind him. Scrooge regarded everybody with a delighted smile. Good morning, sir. Morning. Merry Christmas to you. He had not gone far when coming on towards him. He beheld the gentleman who had walked into his counting room the day before. It sat and hanged across his heart how, how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met, but he knew what path lay straight before him. He took it. My dear sir, how do you do? I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. Mr. Scrooge. Yes, that is my name, and I fear it may not be a pleasant one to you. Allow me to ask your pardon. And I will have the goodness of my heart to accept the gift and the amount of it. Here, Steve, whispered in his name. Lord bless me, my dear. Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you please, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. He went to the church and walked about the streets. He and watched people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head. Um, the question begged and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He turned his steps towards his nephew's house and passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. He turned the door now shakily, but entered. They were looking at the table which was spread out in a great array. Fred! Why, bless my soul, who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I have come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Scrooge was at home in five minutes. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, how he wanted to catch Bob Cratchit coming in late. He was a full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat at his door wide open so that he might seem to come in. Mr. Cratchit, what do you mean by coming here at this time of the day? 
I'm very sorry, sir. I'm behind my time. You are. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please, Mr. Crackett. Uh, it's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry myself yesterday. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand this thing any longer. Therefore, therefore, I'm about to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the moon. A Merry Christmas to you, Bob. A Merry Christmas. Bob, my good fellow, that I have been given to you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family. We will discuss your affairs this afternoon over a Christmas Day with Bob. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became a good friend. It was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. And out. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Thank heaven. I'm getting terribly thirsty. I don't think I've had enough to last me a lifetime. I don't think I'll ever drink again. <laughs> we can sure thank Clara for jumping in. She was a match. Oh, Bobby Doris, thanks. Anyway, I better skedaddle before. I have to find out how many stacks of paper I got left on my desk while I was gone. Yes, thanks, sis. Well, thank you, dear, dear brother. See you later, alligator. Yeah. That was terrific, everyone. Great job. I've never felt so positive after a performance. Nothing could take this away from me. Okay, people. You have disappointed me. I'm so sorry. It's fine. I said he was my fourth husband. While signing the divorce papers, he had an aneurysm and shot. So that's not how I got it all. That includes this infernal radio station nobody wants. So now I'm at the end of my rope and have to put up with you drunken nodheads. So give me one good reason I shouldn't fire you all and hire the McCartney sisters. This metal, this metal! This just came over the wire. We didn't just be everyone in the region, we'd be everyone in the country. Are you kidding? <laughs> I will say that what? is impressive. 